Va bene. We want to finish now this lecture with one last important example. And this is the Euler gamma function. To const const uh, construct this function as an infinite product, we consider the sequence Gn of holomorphic function defined on C, where n now is p or equal than zero. G zero is the function z, G one is the function z plus one. And for all n big or equal than two, Gn will be given by one plus z over n times one minus one over n to the z. And the thing we want to show is that this infinite product with these functions gn converge uniformly on compact sets. So n going from zero to infinity, gn <clears throat> converges uniformly on compact sets. And we will see we cannot directly use the lemma. Um, we have to do uh, something uh, a bit uh, different, some kind of ge generalization, because we will need to consider now the expansion of the logarithm to the second order, while in the other case, we would uh, consider this to the first order. So what we want now is not only that the logarithm of one is equal to zero, but we want also to know that the derivative of the logarithm, logarithm at one is equal uh, to one. Then we can find some constant, big D, such that the logarithm of W minus W minus one, this is less or equal than D, times w minus one, and this should hold for all w in the disk of radius one half and center one. And here I forgot w minus one uh, to the two. So now take an integer k big or equal than one and consider the compact set dk zero. And as uh, number in zero, we will take 2k. So now what we want to do, we want to estimate the logarithm of gn of z when z is in this uh, disk. So for all z in the disk, dk0, we want to estimate the logarithm of gn in norm. So let's uh, first of all uh, compute this logarithm. So here you see gn is a product of uh, two things. Uh, so here we are taking uh, n bigger or equal than n zero, which is bigger or equal than two. So we have this formula for gn. And you see here, we get the logarithm of one plus z over n plus z times the logarithm of one minus one over n. And we have to check that this is well-defined. And uh, this is due to the fact that the, um, uh, one plus z over n minus one in norm. This is uh, less or equal than k over n. 
and this is uh, less or equal than one half. And in the same way, one minus one over n minus one, this is less or equal than one over n, and this is less or equal than one half. So you see, this implies that, uh, let me put this here. So this implies that one plus z over n and one minus one over n belongs to the disk radius one half and centered one. So for this, um, um, we can use uh, the, um, the expansion, the expansion above. So let me uh, then use the expansion above. So to use the expansion above, you see we have to subtract uh, um, W uh, minus one. Now, so what happens if we do this? So in the first case, in the first case, uh, W is one plus Z over N. So we have to subtract uh, Z over N. And obviously we also have to add it huh? because uh, otherwise we don't get the equality. Then we get Z. And now we get here logarithm of one minus one over N minus minus one over N plus um, minus one over N. Okay, so uh, now you see here, we can uh, simplify this with this. And we get the, the formula logarithm of one plus Z over N minus Z over N plus Z times the logarithm of one minus one over N minus minus one over N. And now we can apply the estimate. So this implies that the logarithm GN is less or equal than the logarithm of one plus Z over N minus Z over N plus norm of Z times the norm of the logarithm of one minus one over N minus minus one over n. Now the estimate on both of these uh, terms gives us d times z over n squared in norm plus norm of z times d times minus one over n squared. Okay, so norm of Z was less or equal than K. And uh, therefore this gives us uh, the estimate D times K squared plus K over N squared. And we can call this Rn. And you see in uh, this case, uh, the sequence is, is convergent the series uh, is convergent. And therefore, by the M test, by M test, the, um, the product of all the, um, uh, sorry, the sum, this sum here, log, Gn for n zero to infinity is uniformly convergent on um, the disk. It was dk zero, and uh, uh, therefore by um, this means that uh, uh, by definition, by definition, the infinite product of these uh, functions is uniformly 
convergent on compact sets. Which is exactly what we uh, had uh, to prove. Very good. So now uh, let's give a name uh, to this infinite product. Uh, so we proved now this proposition that this infinite product converges uniformly on compact, compact sets. So by the proposition function g defined by gz equal to the infinite product is uh, holomorphic. What are uh, the zeros of uh, g? So the zeros of G, these are the union of the zeros of Gn. And the, uh, you see that Gn has a zero, um, exactly the number uh, minus n. Uh, so you see G0 as zero, as, uh, as a zero, uh, zero, G1 as a zero minus one, and Gn has a zero uh, minus, uh, minus n, uh, because this uh, factor here is uh, never zero. And this factor here, you see, is zero uh, equal to zero if and only if z equal to minus n. So what we find is that the zeros of, of g are the uh, non-positive integers. So zero, minus one, minus two, and so on, uh, because the zeros of Gn is just the point minus n for all n bigger or equal than, than zero. So now we want to uh, write uh, a slightly different formula for this uh, G. So observe how we can rewrite uh, Gn. So now um, for n bigger or equal than two, Gn z, this is one plus z over n, one minus one over n to the z. So let's um, put the same uh, denominator. We get n plus z over n. And here we have n minus one to the z over n to the z. Okay, very good. So now if we have uh, this expression, when we compute the product until uh, m, so what, what do we get? We get z0, z1, and then we get uh, now for z2, this is um, z plus two over two times two minus one is one to the z, two to the z. And then you go on like this. So z plus three over three times two to the z over three to the z. And you arrive until the last one, which is z plus m over m times m minus one to the z over m to the z. And so you see here there is uh, some uh, simplification because one to the z is equal to one, and this uh, go all away and remains only m to the z. And uh, at the denominators, we have two times three times four times m, and this is just the factorial of m. So we get uh, then to the following formula. Below we have m factorial m to the z, and above we have the product for n going from zero to m of z plus n. So 
So this means that G of Z can be written as the limit for M going to infinity of uh, this uh, expression. Okay, so this is a uh, nice formula for G, but actually the Euler gamma function is not this, uh, this function G, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's inverse. So let me define the Euler gamma function. So the Euler gamma function, this is uh, called capital gamma, is the meromorphic function on C defined by gamma equal to one over G. So hence, if you want to uh, give now a definition of uh, uh, gamma of Z is just by inverting the limit above. Limit for M going to infinity of M factorial M to the Z and here below you get N from zero to M Z plus N. Also this is uh, also called uh, um, Gauss formula. So very good. So this is the, the function uh, gamma. It's a meromorphic function because it's the uh, inverse of the uh, holomorphic function. What can we say about uh, this uh, function will be contained in the next uh, proposition. So the first property is uh, uh, so-called the functional equation that says that for all Z in C, if I compute gamma of Z plus one, I find Z times gamma of Z. So the function gamma is not one periodic, but it changes in a very nice way when we add one to Z. And to this one can add uh, now some other properties. So for all n equal to one, two, so on the positive integers, gamma n correspond just to the factorial of n minus one. And what happens instead for the uh, non-positive integers? So gamma has simple poles there, has simple poles at minus n equal to zero, minus one, minus two, and so on. And you can also write the residue of gamma at minus n. This is minus one to the n over n factorial. So also here the factorial plays a role in the residue. And the last uh, very important property is that we can get back the sinus function if we multiply gamma z and gamma of one minus z. This is equal to pi over sinus of pi z for all z in C. Okay, so these are uh, the properties we want to uh, show. So let's, let's make uh, here now the proof. So for the first uh, part, we want to compute gamma of Z plus one. So we have a formula written above the Gauss formula. Let's see what happens when we plug Z plus one in this formula. So we have this and below we have Z plus one plus N. So you see above uh, we can, in the numerator, we can 
get rid of uh, one uh, exponent for m. We can put it out. And below we have this sum. And now we can change uh, the index. We can call one plus n equal to l. And therefore we get the product for l now going from one to m plus one of z plus l. So uh, you see this product at the denominator is almost the product we have in the definition of gamma. To arrive to the product we have in the definition of gamma, we have to um, multiply below by z and divide below by z plus m plus one. No? So it's, uh, it's uh, almost the product that we want, but not quite. So if we uh, take the product that we want, we have to go from L, for L from zero to M. But then if we do this, what, uh, uh, what we have to do is that we have to multiply above by Z and uh, below we have to divide by Z plus M plus one. And here we have also M. Okay, so now, you see uh, the limit can be split and we get the limit for m going to infinity of m factorial m to the z over the product for l going from zero to m of z plus l. And here we have another limit z times m z plus m plus one. So the first limit is exactly gamma of z. And the second limit when m goes to infinity gives us z. So we proved the first uh, property. So the second property, uh, we can prove it by induction. So uh, by induction, let's see what is uh, gamma, uh, gamma of one. Gamma of one, if we use again the gas formula, uh, this is m factorial, then times m. And below, we get the product for n going from zero to m of one plus n. Okay, so we're just putting z equal to one in the Gauss, in the Gauss uh, formula. So you see at the denominator, we have m plus one factorial. And therefore this uh, limit here is um, m above and m plus one below and therefore goes to one. Very good, so one, which we uh, obviously we can write as zero factorial. So uh, then the formula for n equal to one is uh, proved. And then now we can do by induction, what is gamma n plus one by property, um, by the first property, this is n times gamma n, and now by the inductive hypothesis, this is uh, n minus one factorial, which is now n factorial. Okay, so also the induction step is uh, proven. Very good, so this is um, uh, the formula at the positive integers. Now let's see what happens at the negative or non-positive integers. To understand what happens in that case, we have to again use the functional equation. So this, maybe let me give it a name once and for all, this is a functional equation. But we will use the functional equation to write gamma z in terms of gamma z plus one. So we just divide by z in this equation. So gamma z is gamma z plus one 
divided by z. And now you can use again the functional equation and get z times z plus one and so on until you get to uh, z plus n plus one and below what you have is um, the product for um, for L going from zero to, um, to N of Z plus L. And this works for all N bigger or equal than zero. So now we want to show uh, that we have a pole at, uh, at uh, minus N and, the res and also what is the residue. We want to find what is the residue. So we can do both at the same time if we compute the limit for Z going to minus N of Z plus N times gamma of Z. Now for gamma of Z, we can uh, plug in the expression we had above. And you see Z plus N is exactly the last factor it, at the uh, denominator. So we get here gamma Z plus N plus one over the product for L going from zero to N uh, minus one of Z plus L. Right, so now we can uh, substitute, uh, we can take the limit. So now the limit is not, not a problem because the denominator is not anymore zero at, at Z equal to minus N. So we get minus N plus N plus one above and below we get minus n plus l. So above this is gamma of one and below we can put minus one to factor. So we get minus one n times because there are n factors at the denominator. And here you have l from zero to n minus one of n minus l. And now you see you recognize everything you want because uh, this is one above and below you get minus one to the N. And this product here is exactly the factorial of N because for L equal to zero, you get N for L equal to one, you get N minus one. And then you arrive until uh, one. You know? So what we have below is exactly N factorial. Right, so this is the uh, shows that this is uh, hence a non-zero number. So we have a pole, simple pole, and the residue is exactly uh, the number that we have found. Very good. So there is only the last property to check. We have to find what is gamma z times gamma one minus z. And to do this, we will do the the same thing, but for the function g. So enough to compute g of z times g one minus z. This has to be equal to sinus of pi z over pi. Okay, so um, what we have to do, we have to take g of z times g of one minus z. So this is the limit as m goes to infinity according to um, the formula of Gauss, which now I write uh, explicitly. So this is z times z plus one times z plus two. And then you go up until z plus m. And below you have the factorial, which also write explicitly is one times two times m times m to the z. And now we do the same thing, but with uh, one minus z. So you, you have here one minus z, and then you have here um, uh, 
uh, y minus z to minus z, because you have to go up by one. And then in the end, you will, uh, you will get m minus one plus one minus z. And finally, m plus one minus z. Below again, the factorial and m to the one minus z. So very good. So now um, we do uh, two things. So the first thing we, we uh, bring uh, forward these three numbers. So you see here, if we multiply m to the z with m to the one minus z, we get an m. So this is the limit for m going to infinity of m plus one minus z over m. This is what happens if we multiply these three numbers. And then for the others, uh, you see we, we pair uh, the uh, factors uh, at denominators and at the numer uh, numerator um, according to the increasing uh, index. So we take z plus one, we divide it by one. We take z plus two, we divide it by two, and so on. We take z plus m and we divide it by m. And the same thing we do on this other side. So we take one minus z, we divide it by one. We take two minus z, we divide it by two. And in the end, we take uh, this one, which is m minus z, and we divide it by m. So if we do this, uh, what do we get? So uh, we have here z is the first one. Then we get uh, one plus z. Then we get one plus z over two. And the last one is one plus z over m. So these are the, the, the factors in the first uh, fraction. In the second fraction, we get one minus z, then one minus z over two. And the last one is one minus z over m. So very good. So here now we can um, multiply one plus z with one minus z, one plus z over two with one minus z over two and so on. And you see, we get something which now looks familiar. So the first limit, we can bring it out, um, bring it out. And then we get the limit for m going to infinity of what? Of z times one minus z squared times one minus z squared over two squared one minus z squared over m squared. So the first limit is uh, one. So this is equal to one. And the second uh, limit is the infinite product z times the infinite product for m going from one to infinity of one minus z squared over m squared. And this we know is the sinus of pi z over pi. Also this we already uh, showed. So this ends then the proof of the, of the proposition. So this last property, for example, can be used also to give a nice formula for the gamma. So we can prove using this last property that gamma of one half is the square root of pi. And this also, you can prove it in the exercises. And uh, um, this uh, corollary can then be used to evaluate some integrals we already encountered. To this purpose, one needs an equivalent definition of the gamma when uh, the real part of z is positive. So with this equivalent definition, we will not uh, prove it here, but one can show 
that for all z in C with a positive real part, then one can write the gamma of z as an integral from zero to infinity of the function t to the z minus one times e to the minus t. Then if we uh, assume this, what well, is uh, square root of pi, this is um, gamma of one half. So one half has a positive real part. So we can use uh, the formula. And you see for z equal to one half, we get here e to the minus t over square root of t dt. And now if we do the change of variables t equal to x squared, we arrive to the integral from zero to plus infinity, e to the minus x squared times two times tx. And therefore this gives us the Gauss integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of e to the minus x squared dx equal to square root of pi which we also already encountered at least once in this uh, course. So very good. So um, the lecture is, uh, is over. What I want to, but I want to finish with a final, a final remark, which um, can be also this, um, uh, maybe a good um, suggestion for uh, a thesis. And uh, the remark is that we have a very nice relationship between the Riemann zeta function and Euler gamma function. So there is a beautiful relationship between the zeta and the gamma. So this relationship I phrase it as a theorem which says that the function function zeta can be extended to a meromorphic function on C. So recall we define zeta only for numbers with real part bigger than one. And this meromorphic extension as a unique pole. And we know that then this pole is z equal to one because the, we saw that the uh, zeta diverges for z equal to one. And one can also show that this pole is simple and the residue of zeta at uh, one is given by one. Moreover, this extension satisfies a very nice um, functional equation called Riemann's functional equation, namely zeta of z is equal to two times two pi to the z minus one times the gamma of one minus z times the zeta of one minus z times sinus of pi z divided by two. And so this is uh, Riemann's functional equation where you see zeta and gamma uh, comes together. For example, one can use uh, um, this, uh, this functional equation to compute zeta of minus one What is z of minus one? So if we plug in minus one here, we get two times two pi to the minus two times gamma of two times zeta of two times sinus of minus pi over two. And all these numbers uh, we have computed. So this is two over four pi squared then we get uh, one factorial. Then z of two, we also computed this is pi squared over six. And finally we get the minus one from the sinus. 
So this number you see is uh, minus one over 12. And now there is this uh, um, nice observation by Ramanujan, which says that if we now consider the sum of all positive integers, so you can think of this as one over one to the minus one plus one over two to the minus one plus one over three to the minus one. So in some sense, and here this is uh, something which is not uh, rigorous, this is exactly zeta of minus one, which we showed is equal to minus one over 12. And so we get uh, in this way, this uh, seemingly paradoxical uh, equation, the sum of all uh, positive integers is equal to minus one uh, twelfth. And this is uh, obviously, uh, it's, um, not uh, uh, an exact uh, statement because the um, extension of z to the to the whole complex plane is not given by the same formula. No? So this uh, this equality here uh, surely it's not uh, true in a strict uh, sense because this extension of z for uh, numbers um, which don't have a real part bigger than one is not given by the formula we have seen in the uh, last lecture, for example. But I wanted to, to end with this uh, beautiful uh, final formula. Okay, so thanks for the attention.